Well, hey everyone, welcome back to the Worth Your Time podcast. I'm your host, Erica, and today I'm speaking with Betsy Painter. She is the author of a new book called A Christian's Guide to Planet Earth, Why It Matters and How to Care for It. Betsy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you came to write a book like this, what your background is and, and where you live and all that good stuff. Sure. Um, so my name is Betsy Painter. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, currently in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, my background, I studied science, mostly animal science. I was on the route to be a, a veterinarian <laughs> um, and then kind of took a detour towards conservation. Um, I just always cared about the planet, endangered species, like elementary school, middle school, I was doing projects, save the rainforest, save the manatees. Um, and I also grew up uh, with a strong faith and personal relationship with God. Um, and those two for me were always connected, but not so much when I, what I learned in school was that the message. So a lot of my background is studying science as well as growing in my personal faith um, and, and learning scripture and um, just personally wrestling with those two things and um, wondering how they fit together. And, and so I ended up working um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service after I graduated. And um, there's an international affairs program. They fund endangered species projects all around the world. Um, so that was me and like big girl job <laughs> doing the real thing, saving snow leopards and turtles and whatnot. Um, and I, I loved it. And I'd also done on the side missions as well in Europe. And so I kind of went back and forth in these two fields. And, um, and then I started, I started writing and because I was a scientist who could write, they had me write. Um, so I was writing about a lot of different environmental um, issues and projects. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how I started to write about the topic. And now I ended up um, studying religion and ecology at Yale in grad school. I just graduated. Wow. Um, so yeah, had two, so three cool. years to just, uh, yeah, step back and really dive into scripture, dive into environmental issues and um, and then have the opportunity to write this book and share what I've learned so far and um, hopefully it's helpful. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so how do we, so um, how do you see after all that studying and, and all of that, how do you see religion, faith, um, and science and environmentalism coming together? Because sometimes, you know, the stereotype is that they're opposites. You know, I don't think that's true, but some people will say that. So, so what have you found? Yeah, so much. Um, I think, I mean, it's pretty simple uh, in my mind anyway. I think it just has a lot to do with why God created the earth and that was out of love. Um, and then, yeah, what, what's our role? Like what's our relationship to God and what's our relationship to the earth? And um, scripture has a, a good amount to say about that. And, and one of those questions is dominion, right? So what does dominion look like? Um, if we are to rule well or in a Christ-like way, that would mean um, it with the with the servant heart and, and a, a gentle and loving attitude. Um, and so, yeah, I there's just so many. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it too has to do with, for me, anyways, um, wonder and just wonder in creation and um, just the fact that. For whatever reason, God created us with eyes, ears, you know, senses, and um, and that creation just really uh, makes us wonder and gives us joy, and it's a way of just um, understanding God in a very um, tangible way, or, or seeing God's love in a tangible way, whether that's a beautiful sunset or the ocean um, or an animal that delights us. Um, yeah, so I see it as a way of one just engaging with God's art, what God's made, and then learning about, about God through that, and also making that connection that we are also designed to depend upon the earth. Um, we need clean air, we need clean water, we need food. Um, all these things come from creation, and so when we care for creation, when we, when we steward or have a healthy dominion um, role with it, then we're actually serving people. Um, and it's actually a way to love people and love God. And so all these things are connected in my mind um, through my studies, just God, us, 
and the earth. Um, and I think it's also just a really joyful, joyful task um, yeah. to be involved in. What do, does the Bible say about our responsibility or just gen, you know, general themes even about our responsibility to care for the earth and, and you know, how, I guess, aggressive should we be about that? Like how, as Christians, um, you know, how concerned should we be with making sure that we're being responsible citizens of planet earth? Yes, um, very concerned <laughs> um, if we care about our neighbor's well-being, very concerned, our own well-being, our family's well-being. Um, yeah, we I just, I think at least, you know, the way I grew up, where I live, everything is just so easily accessible to me. And that's just not the case for most people mm -hmm. around the world. And so, um, yeah, I think really making that connection that what I do, the choices I make, my energy choices, you know, the food I choose to eat, the way I consume water, um, this affects my neighbor. And oftentimes my neighbor who maybe doesn't have the same means I do to provide for myself or to adapt to a changing climate. Um, yeah, so I think if we make the connection to this is um, for people and, and I think about I'm trying to think of like instances where, where, where Jesus really cared for the practical needs, you know, by feeding the 5,000. Um, and there's a, in Acts, there's one of the churches sends provisions to another church in Judea before they have a famine. So they hear about a famine coming immediately, they send food. Um, I think that's what Christians, you know, we've been taught to do that, <laughs> to um, care for those in need. And so I think just making that connection of, caring for those in need includes the earth because most of what we need physically anyways comes from the planet and we are dependent upon its health. Mm -hmm. um, when it's healthy, you know, we're healthy and vice versa. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. Like we often will think like, Oh, somebody needs food. Okay. We're going to get them food. Right. But we're not thinking, uh, in, in terms of the larger picture of well, what would ultimately allow them to, you know, grow and get that food for themselves. Um, you know, how do we create policies and take actions that, um, you know, that love your neighbor in a less, I guess, direct way. Um, right. It, because people often think of loving your neighbor like, oh, that's like, I'm going to go mow their lawn, you know, or, or whatever. And, and so it's, it's actually a much broader way to think about how we love our neighbors across the world, especially, um, you know, and I know sometimes people initially will say, well, like, what do you mean like vulnerable people are more uh, affected by climate change, for example? So, so talk about why that is. Why are people that are in poor countries or poor areas more affected by energy policies and climate change? Sure. Uh, one is sea level rise. So a lot of uh, um, vulnerable populations on the coasts, um, the sea level rising um, in their homes and um, grocery stores or whatnot, um, or infrastructure is in danger. But not only from the sea level rise, but also the um, increased severity of storms and hurricanes and um so those on the coast are often hit the hardest um and and then oftentimes as well um lower income countries may not have the same provisions that we do for um, adapting or bouncing back once something like a stronger storm hits uh, or there's more flooding or there's drought um just don't have the same amount of resources to adapt and um, yeah, make it through a, a tough storm or um, a heat wave. Uh, and, it's, and it's not just, it, it's not just other, other countries and that's definitely something to consider, um, especially when a lot of these countries aren't nearly as <laughs> big of emitters as say the US. Um, but it's also uh, lower income or vulnerable people in the US. Um, and oftentimes people of color in neighborhoods who um, have to live closer to polluting industries because um, it's cheaper or because they're stuck from, you know, an old policy um, that's kind of keeping them in poverty or cycles of poverty. 
um, that or, you know, we have these heat waves and, you know, we're all complaining. <laughs> like I've been complaining the past weekend, it's been so hot. And then I'm thinking about like some of the homeless people I know in the area and being like, oh, are they okay? You know, like, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, just thinking about like, we have air conditioning and, and so just a lot of those ways in which, um, yeah, I'm, I have a lot of means of dealing with, uh, if there's a big storm or a heat wave or a drought, finding food. Um, yeah, or food, food insecurity, a lot of um, lower income families uh, suffer from food insecurity. And although we make plenty of food, we make more food than we need actually, if there's so much food waste, it's more so like getting or having, like you said, the policies that like help make sure the food gets to the people who need it. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are, you know, I'm, I'm looking just here on your book page at some of the things that you talk about in the book. And, you know, I think it's like, what are the practical things that we can be doing? I, I think it often feels very overwhelming to look at climate change and to look at the environment and be like, well, what the heck? Like, you know, I recycle, but you know, that's not enough. Right. So, um, what can we as individuals and as, as Christians that want to love our neighbor in this way do? Yeah. Um, so, so in my book, I do try to, and I kind of start off in the introduction saying, I don't want this is to like overwhelm, you know, I don't want to paralyze people with options right. and, or just be like the, the problems are too big. And so, you know, one of, one of my um, recommendations is to just start somewhere, you know, start with something you know you can change. Um, or that's I'm going to bike more, or I'm going to look into solar panels, you know, it depends on everyone has, you know, what they're able to do where they're at in their lives. Um, and then to build on, build on from that. Because honestly, once you start doing that, you feel good. Like you feel like I am being intentional. I am like trying to love people well. And, um, and often the result of that is peace and joy. And so you just want to do more. Um, yeah. So some things that come to mind uh, that are practical, uh, things to change quickly would be, yeah, plastic is a huge one. So just like being really diligent about reducing uh, plastic use, not just recycling, but like starting to refuse um, plastic wherever you can. And again, that's like, you don't have to go full. I mean, some people do go full and I'm like, go ahead. That's great. But uh, you know, it's like, my mom was like, she read my book and she's like, you know, I, I got some reusable plastic bags. And I was like, yay. You know, so like, yes, first you know, step. yeah. Um, that, yeah, and just think about where your energy comes from, like uh, having just to do the research with utilities and, you know, utilities are kind of run different depending on the state. So figuring out like what are the greener options, renewable options, it just requires some, um, some research and, and seeing what's available. Um, and then, yeah, transportation is huge. So like, do I, can I bike more? Can I afford an electric vehicle? Um, can I carpool? Can I use public transit? Um, and then what, what you eat as well. So cutting back on meat is, is a big one. Um, and again, that's not, I don't- Why does that, say, why does cutting back on meat help? Sure. Um, Cause we cut one, because cows emit a lot of methane, um, bless their hearts, we love them, but they are gassy. And, uh, and methane is very potent greenhouse gas. It doesn't last in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide, but it's very strong. Um, so there's that, but also oftentimes um, a lot of our like monocultures and agriculture. So uh, when we just grow one kind of crop, often like a grain um, or corn, that actually goes to feeding the livestock rather than, so we're not just growing food, like instead of using that land to like grow vegetables, healthy vegetables for people, we're, we're growing a lot of cereal crops and a lot of that goes to towards like feeding livestock. Um, and then also oftentimes in certain areas of the world, um, deforestation is from a lot to do with cattle ranching. Hmm. Um, so it's not actually like, if you love red meat, like that doesn't have to be the main thing that you, you know, cut back on, but you can like look for, you know, local options or just, um, yeah, ways to reduce. Um, there's also, you know, the, was it unbelievable, impossible burger, or yeah. like that kind of stuff. Yeah. I make that for everything now. Yeah. And, and for me, sausage. Like, I'm, I'm not a, yeah, for anything. I think McDonald's has like some kind of like, is I it chicken anymore? Do. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but I mean, like for me, for example, I, I don't love the taste of red meat. So that's like, obviously I should, you know, give that up unless I'm like, I'm at a cookout and I don't want to like be rude. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I think too, I think, I hope the people who read the book as well, like there's 11 chapters and each one covers different area of the planet. So, you know, there's wetlands, there's the ocean, um, the air, water. And so I'm hoping that people who read it, maybe certain chapters will really like capture their imagination or they really get passionate about that issue. And so- Is it the kind of book where, sorry, can people, it doesn't need to be read straight through or can people kind of pick a chapter and dig in? Yeah, yeah. You can definitely just look at the table of contents and be like, I like coral reefs. I'm going to read about this. So if you just need to start with like one chapter and be like, I'm going to care about like woodlands and forests. Like I think that's, you know, I think about the diversity of the body of Christ and like we have different gifts and, you know, we're drawn to different issues for different reasons and we're each one person. So I think it's good if it's something, yeah, really kind of captures your heart to, to go after that and see what you can do in that area. That's a great point. Um, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, what you type, what you write about animals. Like it says, you know, here, you know, what do animals tell us about God's design for the earth? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I love animals. I've always yeah. been What's your favorite lover. animal? Yeah. Uh, it's no leopards. Oh my gosh. My <laughs> son would totally love that you said that. <laughs> yeah, I leopards. Um, yeah, I, so I studied animal science in undergrad. So obviously I'm a big animal person and, um, yeah, I, I just think I'm, one of the things I say about animals is that I love is that they just naturally glorify God. They just, just by being themselves, like yeah. just a squirrel being a squirrel, eating a nut, that's what it was created to do. Love and it. it's glorifying God doing that. And just the simplicity of that, of just like being human and like that glorifies God. And hmm. um, so, yeah, it'll just remind me to take myself a little less seriously <laughs> and just enjoy being a creature uh, created by a loving God. And um, yeah, so they just, they teach me a lot. I learn, I feel like, um, you know, I, I think about planet earth as God's living sculpture and mm. an active, like living piece of art that God co- cooperates with. Um, and yeah, so I just kind of like any artist, they kind of put a piece of themselves into their work. So I just feel like each creature has a unique design that tells us something about the maker's creativity or um, quirkiness <laughs> or right. um, beauty um, or yeah, just the diversity as well. It's just all like yeah, all inspiring. There's just so many different creatures. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, let me see here. So, okay. Oh yeah, this is what I was going to ask you. What? Now, I know there's been a lot more um, Christians and faith-based people that have, you know, kind of rose up to um, support environmental issues. I know there's a lot of groups out there now. Like I have interviewed and spoken with people from uh, what is it, young, e- young Evangelicals for a Climate st- Solution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 you can, yeah. Talk to them, and but but I've also seen a lot of other ones. So so, how do you think that trajectory has changed over time, and and do you see it getting better? Yeah, I have noticed there's there's a lot of <laughs> environmental um, Christian organizations um, that are really starting to step up, and it's exciting. And I think, yeah, I think, um, I, yeah, I hope it I hope it continues. And I and I one of the things I think about is just these one of the challenges of writing this, writing this book, one, I wrote it during the pandemic, so that was one, and the other is the issues are really big, and I'm one person, you know, at this time um, in quarantine researching all the issues, and so it just made me realize how much, like, we need to do this together, and and I think there's a lot of opportunity as well for, like, ecumenical work, so, like, um, partnerships between denominations, um, and so even, like, a, a means to like unify the church for like um, and a shared love of God and love of people on the earth. Um, so I, I get really excited when I see different Christian organizations um, getting involved and wanting to make a difference. And um, yeah, I think I also I also hope that you know it's a good witness to um, to the rest of the world about that you know we love God and we love and we believe that God you know sent His Son to save. I think the verses um so save the world but the um yeah so god god so loved the world he sent his only son um 
and the world the world there is cosmos which actually means like the entire universe mm -hmm. uh, so it's god so loved the universe that he sent his son oh, um yeah so it's also um I, I think more christians kind of connect god has saved us and that is so wonderful and enough for us to give our lives um it's even like more amazing that god cares about all of creation um all of his artwork and is working to restore it it says all things are going to reconcile through christ mm -hmm. um you know all creation groans waiting for liberation with the sons and daughters of god it's romans 8 20 Wow. ish somewhere um, there. hey yeah. you remember, even a chapter i'm impressed it's hard <laughs> to remember references. somewhere in romans <laughs> like i can remember verses all day but i cannot remember a reference <laughs> new testament <laughs> right um yeah. yeah i just think and i think there's hope to that as well when we hear so many you know there's all this upsetting news it's rightly upsetting and should you know convict us and make us want to do something but also just thinking about you know, the, the end picture of the gospel, which is a new creation and a new heavens, a new earth. And there's a lot of mystery wrapped up in that, but um, there's also theologians from, you know, very early on uh, writing about this continuity between this world, this creation and the new one to come. Um, yes. Which I think is just as like, gives us stability and hope when things are looking bleak. Yeah. And I just, I mean, two thoughts can come to mind. One is, you know, recently when we have seen the amazing views from the universe, from the space, from the telescope, the web telescope, mm -hmm. like that, I mean, space to me is just so much, like I can't wrap my brain around it. <laughs> but when you look at those images and then you look and you see earth over here, so, so tiny, um, <laughs> you're like, wow, like, we better i'm like we better take care of this place look how small we are in the vastness of this universe and then also just like you were saying like god's living sculpture that was like a beautiful phrase and i agree i just think in terms of like having like awe and respect for our creator like we have to take care of the planet like this is his this isn't ours and we don't have any right to do something to it that um causes it harm and of course there's a lot of that goes into that like policies and you know yeah. what people think is best and what's good yeah. for people too and you know there's a lot that you have to consider but hopefully when people are thinking about this they are as christians considering that the earth is not ours just like nothing is ours N none of the things that we have are ours and and so we should you know operate as if we are caring for the the possessions of our king which which is what we're doing so yeah. it's a really cool way to think about it um so wow so you you just graduated from with your graduate degree from yale which is crazy yeah. um, i mean crazy awesome um and so what is next for you what are you going to do next yeah so i actually just finished i was doing a little summer program i was teaching um students from Latin America, I was teaching them uh, science and religion, uh, no, sorry, science and theater, which was a lot of fun. So yeah, that's, of, like, the universe, one cool. of the, yeah, one of the things, one of the plays we started with was Life of Galileo and about the Copernican revolution and how the church was like kind of behind the uh, earlier theory that everything revolves around the earth. And then, and then there was that huge shift when Galileo and the telescope was like, never mind you know, like you're saying, Earth is actually very small and the universe is way bigger than we imagined. And, and I think that kind of gave everyone an identity crisis of like, we're not special. We're not in the, in the center of everything. And I just like what you said, because it just made you think about like, like, I just think we are humbled. And that's a good thing of just being like, this is not about us. You know, I mean, God loves us and we are an important part of this picture. But ultimately, yeah, it's, it's, preserving and working for God's glory of wanting, you know, creation to flourish. Um, right. Anyway, so that just made me think of Galileo. I love Galileo. Um, right. Also, sorry, but Galileo was a scientist. He was also a very devout Catholic. Um, yeah, there's love. so many scientists that I yeah. yeah. realize were very faithful. And I feel like it's such a, like a myth that all these scientists are or like atheists, because I don't, I've read statistics recently, I can't remember what they were, but it wasn't like 
crazy number of atheists. Like what most people are not atheists. Yeah, <laughs> yeah more in awe of. It's yeah, hard to be an atheist. I mean, to just go. Like, oh, well, here we were. <laughs> you know, just like <laughs> nothing. <laughs> um, it, it's. It, I can't remember what I was reading the other day. That was just so fascinating. Like even these atheist um, scientists were like kind of like reluctant to say, well, if there was, you know, if there was something, you know, <laughs> um, so it's just kind of interesting to think about all that. And, but also really good just to know, you know, I think one of the things I've studied in the past couple of years is, you know, folks that have left the church and um, like deconstructing or, you know, for what, whatever reasons they have left the faith. And a lot of what comes up sometimes is is the science thing and, and yeah. i know we're not talking about creationism today when i won't make you talk about that <laughs> but but the 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 fact is that science and faith are not in conflict and yeah. it makes me really sad that people have like left their faith because they feel that they are when you know what i learned is that there are a lot of christians that some do believe in creationism some don't there's a lot of theories in there and that's okay and yeah. it doesn't mean that, you know, that our faith is like in vain if we can't, right. you know, a hundred percent say which one it was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that is something I very much care about of this like compatibility between science and faith. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes they do speak different languages, you know, it's a different way. Science is studying, you know, matter and the physical world and, you know, faith, you can't, you know, put a microscope on the Holy Spirit, <laughs> like, you just, you know, <laughs> And so there's something, you know, wise about like, they are different fields, maybe different languages, but they definitely communicate. And um, sometimes they butt heads, <laughs> but like any relationship is worth working through and kind of right. always more complex than, um, than we think. And, and the narrative is always, yeah, broader. And, and I think um, even with Galileo, for example, uh, he just is a legend to me because he really tried to uh, work with the church and and kind of show and work with theologians and show how the new science um, would be compatible. Um, you know, obviously now the church accepts that the earth goes around the sun. Yeah. Um, most of them do, as far as I know. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, and now, you know, climate change has been one that's been this like kind of interesting, gotten in the realm of religion and um, politics and yeah. Um, yeah but it's like, a bit partisan, the, the like the actual conversation gets really muddy and that's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. And so just trying to like, yeah, you know, kind of piece it piece it out, but also like um yeah, find a find a way to talk about it but in a way that people are open to and, and will understand. And um and I also just want to say I think for a lot of things I think about with the science religion thing is you know with evolution, with climate change, with the earth revolving around the sun, you know, these these things aren't, at least in my opinion, understanding matters of salvation, like what you understand about the way the universe functions um, is not the like pinpoint of salvation, right? It is what you believe about Jesus. Right, right. Um, there's so many, I mean, there's so many right. things that we are not ever going to come to an agreement on. That's why there's so many denominations. That's, you know, it's like, there's the main things, there's yeah. the core things. And there's not very many of those. And so, (laughs) you know, we have to work out, work out the rest of it in faith and and with a pure heart and, you know, doing the best we can, but nobody's ever going to answer, (laughs) you know, it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So I think sometimes we just make the stakes higher than they actually are. And that's maybe why people, it's just hitting chords that like, you know, bring about more fear than like love and understanding. Um, Mm -hmm. Um, but also, you know, worth, worth talking about and worth, um, communicating about and trying to, yeah, yeah understand each other. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, um, it looks like you, I mean, this book could be used for all kinds of, of groups and people who, I mean, who do you think it's really meant for? Who did you write it for? Sure. Also, I didn't answer your question before then what I'm doing next. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. We just got off on a tangent. I'll just quickly. I, um, I want, I want to get involved in, in wetlands restoration. I'm really into wetlands and there's a chapter on wetlands. Um, they are very good, like nature-based solutions, kind of working with like the wisdom of creation that God like put in creation and finding like working with nature to like help it flourish and also protect us. 
Um, and also I'd, I'd love to keep, keep writing and keep talking to people and um, really interested in, in devotional writing, especially bringing out, um, there's so much beautiful writing about earth and faith and creation from oh, like yeah. early church mothers and fathers, which is gold that I discovered in grad school. And I really want to share oh, it. Oh my gosh, so, there's so much you could do. We should talk because I have a lot yeah. of tips. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, there's so much there that in needs history. to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then who this book was for. Um, so I, I have an evangelical background. Um, and I think I love, I think evangelical has a lot of definitions at the moment. Um, but the one I, one I pull from or hold to is, is just, just really love Jesus and like relationship with Jesus. I like that. I like that so much. I agree, agree on this. <laughs> it's better than um, the other ones I've been hearing lately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, let's just, pull. Um, but yeah, so people who really love, um, love Jesus and want to understand how loving the earth or caring for the earth is connected to that, but also people who really um, value scripture and like want to kind of use scripture as a lens to look at issues because kind of what I do for myself um, of just, yeah, so um, people who love Jesus, the Bible, and want to understand like how these things are related to earth and caring for planet, but also with that said, happy for anyone to read it and find it helpful because the practical tips, you know, for really for anyone and, um, yeah. and the inspiration, the hope and, um, yeah, so really anyone that it would help. And yeah. yeah, I think it'd be a cool book for like churches to get. And, um, just like anywhere where people are like seeking resources on different yeah. issues. So churches listen up, do the work for yeah. a church. <laughs> figure out how to get this out there. <laughs> do a small group study on it or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I definitely did have in mind as well, small groups. So like, do like reading a book with people. Yes. So it's not, at, so that like, always better. Like, I think. Yeah. Especially just talk about the things like together that. and see what comes up. And also Kind of have accountability partners of like we're gonna like reduce this much waste for you know this long or we're gonna bike this much together um just makes it more fun yeah totally agree that's awesome well i see that you can get it on amazon i bet you can get it a bunch of other places too right mm -hmm. all the yeah. places the books are sold online i assume yeah, yeah. Barnes and Noble, target walmart <laughs> oh my goodness that's amazing well that's awesome so everybody pick up a copy of this book um, before you go, I like to ask people what they've been reading. If you have any recommendations, podcasts, books, shows, what have you been loving lately, if anything? Yeah. Um, so because I just graduated to grad school, I've been kind of zeroing in on poetry. So I don't want like, I've taken a break from the like hefty theological. Yeah, ones. yeah, yeah. Um, so I have this. Um, this one is M.S. Merwin. The essential. So he um, is a poet who I think he lived in Hawaii and was just a farmer and wrote some like really beautiful um, poems with nature. And, um, oh, wow. and then this one I started World of Wonders and Praise of Fireflies, Whale Sharks, and Other Astonishments. And that's a really cool cover. Oh, cool. Um, it's like little, little like short essays about like different creatures and oh. reflections and. Um, I'm trying to think there's so many good um and then um there's something called hymns on paradise by ephraim the syrian mm -hmm. that's been somewhat recently translated um and he was a third century um saint i don't know if he was catholic or orthodox saint maybe both of them um maybe some Episcopals as well. But anyways, he was a, a very strong believer and um, really worked. He Sorry, lived in a I cave. Fly. You got to fly all over my head and I'm driving me crazy. Don't you love nature? Oh, I know. I need my, <laughs> going to get rid of this nature in a minute. <laughs> very fair. Um, but anyways, he, yeah, really worked uh, during a plague, um, helping uh, poor communities from a cave. But he also wrote this incredible poetry and hymns and imagery about um, the environment of paradise. So kind of talking about new heavens, new earth, uh, but using very like lovely imagery. Um, so yeah, that's another. You know, one of the, I, somebody um, that I follow, I don't know if you know her, Kaylin Scheiss. Um, uh, she is, does like the Holy, ah! <laughs> the Holy Post podcast. Anyway, I had her on my podcast and she wrote the book Liturgy of Politics, but 
I can't remember what she said this on Twitter, I think. And, and it was something like, what's the, what advice would you give your younger self? Or like, what what's the best advice you could give younger Christians today or something? And she was like, read older books. Yeah. Um, and I was like, that's such a good idea because we're always so enamored by the the new one that's coming out. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm like, a just buying them. I love, I love buying books. I'm a, yeah. I'm a reader. <laughs> Um, but man, there's so much good stuff from way back in the day. And I mean the day, like you're talking about, um, and nobody reads that stuff or many people don't read that stuff. And it's, yeah. so, it's so full of wisdom and, 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 and context. And, you know, we don't even realize, um, you know, what we're missing when we don't take the time to, to learn from, you know, people from long ago, Christians from long yeah. ago, um, that were living out you know, things that we may not even realize, like, actually it's similar stuff, but just in a different time. So yeah. Yeah. And it's always yeah encouraging and makes you feel, I know, connected to the body of Christ and mm -hmm. just that like, this is not new. <laughs> you know, this is inter it's like, yeah, it's kind of cool. Cause it's like this, this like timeless connection, you know, and it's like mm -hmm. when we're in heaven, that's not going to matter anyways. And so it's really cool to, to read these people from, from times past. And I should take my own advice because I don't do it very often. Um, <laughs> but that's same. That's anyway. like, I need to do more of it for sure. Yeah. Well, Betsy, thank you so much for you, chatting with me and just, uh, talking about this really important issue. I think it is important. I think more people are starting to care about it in the faith community and see good stuff happen. And I hope everyone buys your book and, and <laughs> just gets some practical tips. I think it's one of those things where it's like, it's practical. It's a, pra it's a book that is, gives you actual ideas. You don't have to think of them yourself. You, you, she gives them to you. So, um, so thank yeah. you so much. And, um, it was great talking with you. Yes, you as well. Thank you for your time. This is fun. <laughs>